I'm going to start with a story. My books are always full of stories because I think that stories are how people remember things. They're also full of data, but you know, you end up having to look up the data. It's usually the story you remember. So this story concerns um, an academic in the United States. He's an evolutionary biologist named William Muir. And William Muir was very interested in how competition actually plays out in animal life cycles. And of course, like all good evolutionists, he understood about natural selection. He understood how that has been morphed in popular conception to the idea of the survival of the fittest. And he, he asked good, hard-nosed scientific questions, which was, what does this actually mean? How does it really work? And as it happened, all of his work was done with chickens, which made this experiment particularly easy to conduct. So what he did, he was interested in what, how evolution selected for productivity. And so he, he created essentially two flocks of chickens. One flock consisted of chickens he just randomly chose. They were basically healthy, they were basically productive, and it's easy to measure productivity in chickens because it's how many eggs they produce. So he put a whole, about a dozen of these very average normal chickens into one flock, and he left it for six generations. And then he created, at the same time, a different flock, where he went all through his laboratory chicken yard, identifying the individually most productive chickens, the ones that produced exceptionally high numbers of eggs. And all of these super chickens, in essence, he put into one other flock, a sort of super flock. And he left that for six generations. And when he came back, what he wanted to know was what had evolution done. And what he discovered was that the average flock was really healthy, very robust, fully feathered, very happy, and more productive than it had ever been. And when he went to visit the super flock, what he found shocked him. All but three were dead. <laughs> and the three that remained were in a very sorry sight indeed, with eyes pecked out and very bloody feathers everywhere. Now, when Muir presented the slides of his experiment to his colleagues, one of them jumped up and said, looking at the picture of the sad super flock, said, that's my lab. <laughs> And as I've gone around the world talking about my work, many people have said to me, that's my company. That's my department. That's where I live. <laughs> and what I think is so interesting about this experiment is partly that it has some real scientific grounding about it. But I think it somehow encapsulates what many of us feel, which is that we have all of these systems and theories which make lots of super chickens clustered together in the belief that this will create something marvelous. And actually, it's producing exactly the opposite. Now, when I started doing the research for my book, it's, it really was kicked off by a question in my mind, which had been provoked by my earlier book. And that, in that book, I'd been looking at willful blindness, why we ignore what's in front of us. And in the course of that research, I had interviewed the head of risk in a major bank who had said to me, look, Margaret, we all knew subprime mortgages were toxic. We knew they ripped off poor people. But here's the deal. We're in a competitive market for salespeople, and we had to offer these high commission products to keep our sales force. And that left me with a question, which was, I'd always been told that the way competition worked was it drove organizations and people to create a wide diversity of products which both satisfied a range of customers and also diversified risk. That competition was supposed to produce diversity. And actually here was this chief risk officer saying to me it had produced conformity, that actually it made everybody do the same things. And so that provoked the question, which was, okay, here we have an example 
where competition didn't produce the beneficial outcome we're always told it necessarily will. So I set myself the question, are there other situations in which competition doesn't deliver on its productive, benevolent promise? And of course, one of the first examples I found was William Muir's chicken study. But I found it in all sorts of perhaps surprising places. When I looked at the world of education, what I found was that generations of kids have now been brought up and their parents have brought them up to compete. So the parents compete to get the kids into the right school, the kids compete for the best grades, to get into the best secondary schools, to get into the best universities. And this is having a really interesting, what they call perverse outcome, which is namely that what we're also seeing is rate, higher rates of cheating on exams and plagiarism with the result that now virtually every university in the world puts all work submitted by its students through anti-plagiarism software because the rates of plagiarism are so high. And of course the company making this software has to keep tweaking it because these clearly very intelligent students keep trying to find ways around it. In other words, they've become really good at cheating rather than really good at studying. So it was interesting in education to see even in some systems where kids are ranked in their classes that those kids were specifically being discouraged by their parents from helping each other. So imagine if you have a class of 20 students and you happen to be in the top three. And this is a, a situation a parent described to me. When one of the kids said, I need help on a project, his mother said, don't help her. She might rise in the rankings and you'll fall down. So this is a very interesting way to start your life. Then I looked, of course, necessarily in the world of sport because I was doing much of my research in the run-up to the London Olympics. So I interviewed lots and lots of Olympic um, athletes. And most of them, it has to be said, aren't in the book because, to be honest, the interviews were so boring, <laughs> they nearly killed me. <laughs> and, and the reason, as I came to understand, was once you've decided this is what you want to do, you don't do anything else. If you aren't overtraining, you're not training hard enough, and there isn't time for anything else. And of course, what this means is a couple of things. First of all, what everybody forgets, 96% of the athletes left the Olympics with nothing. And I don't just mean no medals. I mean no medals, no money, and no prospects. Because the whole of the prime of their youth had taken them away from their education and focused them on something that now had no currency. And it's really striking interviewing former uh, Olympic aspirants who now look back and think, first of all, where did my childhood go? And how do I now put some kind of career together for myself? In addition, I interviewed Travis Tiger. Travis Tiger runs uh, the US Anti-Doping Agency and is widely credited with the, as being the man who brought down Lance Armstrong. And Tiger, like everyone I spoke to, loves sport, was increasingly depressed by the prevalence of doping, the kind of arms race in terms of drugs, doping, cheating, and catastrophic injuries in sport. So he commissioned a beautiful piece of research where he asked a large number of people, you know, what, what is it we all love so much about sport? And they all invariably said the same thing, which is it teaches great lessons of collaboration, mutual support, discipline, dealing with failure, uh, reciprocity, generosity, and so on. But when he asked those same people, what is it that really matters in sport, the answers were always unequivocal, competition and winning. And the conclusion that Tiger drew was interesting. He said the focus on winning has now become so intense 
that it explains why in the United States, by the age of 11, 80% of kids have given up on all sports completely. They have absorbed the message that if you can't win, it's not worth playing. Now, of course, the whole theory, at least in the UK, behind the Olympics was, well, we'll have all these fantastic elite athletes and they will drive sports participation. What Tigert was finding was exactly the opposite, that it discouraged sports participation. And in fact, a study of the Sydney Olympics showed that the only leisure activity that had increased since the Olympics was watching television. <laughs> so it turned out that no more than in economics does trickle-down work in sports. Having an elite level does nothing for anybody else. And for the elite level, it incurs a tremendous cost. Not just lost education, lost childhoods for athletes, but increasingly at an extraordinarily high level of injuries. So for example, in American football, you've seen this really frightening increase in chronic brain trauma, with the result that a very large number of American retired football players now are dying in their 40s because of the concussions that they've suffered. One NFL player, Dave Dewerson, in 2011, specifically shot himself through the heart in order that his brain could be studied by science to understand what the impact of this highly competitive sport had had on his brain. So, so, the great, so sport, of course, is a great metaphor for business and for many aspects of our lives. But the reality of it leaves us with some rather troubling questions. I also, because I'm really interested in science for all sorts of reasons, um, went and talked to a number of people leading tremendously successful scientific labs. These are people who are trying to solve very, very hard problems. And of course, one of the things that's interesting about science is people going, go into it thinking it's about a love of knowledge, and then they discover it's one of the most competitive fields on Earth, which is not what they imagined. And as they struggle for resources to do their work, as they struggle and compete to get their work published in scientific journals, which is how they keep their jobs, what are we finding? We're finding an increasing rate of retraction in scientific journals. So the number of papers over published over the last 10 years has increased by 45%. But the retraction rate, that's papers withdrawn because the data is dodgy or fraudulent, has increased by 200%. In addition, we're finding more spectacular examples of major scientific frauds, like the case of Jan Hendrik Schoen. And we're also finding huge examples of people slicing and dicing data into so many different papers that nobody can really make any sense of it anymore. So these, you know, the problems with retracted papers is not just that that's a bad paper that got published in place of a good one. But these bad papers and fraudulent data lead people down blind alleys for years, consuming vast resources because they're based on data that turned out not to be true. Now in the world of business where I've spent the last 20 years of my life, where competition plays out specifically in management, is really interesting. Most organizations, not all, but most of the world's large global organizations manage their people within competitive performance management systems. So they assess everybody every year, they put them on a bell curve, they throw out the bottom 10% and they reward the top 10%. Now you don't have to be a mathematical genius to figure out that most people are going to lose in this system. It's supposed to motivate them, but it's pretty easy to figure out that most people have to be losers. And it's pretty easy to figure out also that the safest place is in the middle, where you, if you keep your head down and you don't come out 
with difficult information or brilliant ideas, you'll be left alone. In addition, what you find is in that top 10%, just like at school, people don't support each other. I'm not going to help you with your project, because if I do, you might go up the rankings and I might fall out. And so, for example, one of the most spectacular examples of this over the last 10 years has been Microsoft, which people have been saying to Microsoft for years, you should ditch this system. But one of the reasons they've been saying that is because most of the value in Microsoft could derive from the cross, per, for, sorry, the cross fertilization of all their different business areas. But they don't interoperate. Nobody in one silo will talk to anybody in another silo because they're all going to be ranked and there is nothing in it for them. So Microsoft has failed to be, to be a significant player in the database market, in the mobile market, in the internet so technology market, in the games market. It's come very late to all of those areas and failed to excel in most of them. Now, when you look at the way companies compete with each other, you get a similar kind of predictable outcome, which is everybody thinks it's great, but there are all these things happening they prefer not to pay attention to. So one way companies compete is they all try to be the biggest. So we have things like the FTSE 100 and the Fortune 500, which are all about how big are they. Well, the cheapest, easiest, fastest way to get really big is just buy another company. And every, all the bankers celebrate when M&A season is back on the books. What they conveniently ignore is that according to, you know, depending on whose research you believe, 50 to 80% of these acquisitions fail. That is, they fail to achieve the strategic aims for which they were executed. They make the companies bigger, but they don't make them more productive. They make them much harder to manage. So the quest to become big doesn't seem to deliver huge long-term results. The quest to become cheap similarly seems very problematic. So one of the other things you've seen across the developed world is that fundamental food products like meat have become steadily cheaper and cheaper as we've industrialized meat production. But of course, we've only been able to do that because we've externalized all the real costs of making cheap food. And if you want to understand what externalization of those costs means, you can fly over most of Northern Carolina which is where there is a hog population that creates the same volume of waste. Sorry to talk about this over dinner. It produces the same volume of waste as the entire human population of Canada. It has to go somewhere. And so it's collected in vast lagoons, which is really a vast vat in the ground, and is then sprayed over soybean crops which means it enters the water table, which means it enters the river. The environmental degradation of this part of the country is indescribable. And that's the cost of cheap meat, just as the cost of cheap clothing are disasters that we've seen at places like Rana Plaza. The other great competitive drive, of course, which is kind of where I started, is to do what everybody else is doing. So it doesn't create diversity, it means company, companies copying each other. So one of the things we've seen recently in the ph pharmaceutical industry is that while we have huge challenges in pharmaceutical, for example, the failure of any company to, to introduce into the market a new antibiotic is currently considered to be one of the biggest crises confronting world health today. The chief medical officer, Sally Davies, said the other day that it threatened to mean that having an operation in the 21st century will become like having one in the 19th century because we can cure the cancer, but if we have to do the operation, we have no antibiotics left that will work. 
In the meantime, the pharma companies are developing copycat drugs, Me Too drugs is what they call them, where some, one company introduces a new drug, everyone else finds a minor, 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 minor variant of it, so they'll do a left-handed version of it in essence, and introduce it into a market that their competitor has already prepared for them. Now you would think, ah, oh, now there are more drugs for the same illness, they must come down in price. But they don't. They double in price. So we have more expensive drugs all treating the same diseases, while lots of other medical needs lie completely unattended. Now, of course, as I was doing this research, a lot of people were saying to me, but Margaret, there's no other way. I mean, it's just nat natural people are naturally competitive. It's just the way it is. Get over it. And I thought that was a reasonable challenge, except for several things. One is, I do believe all people are competitive, but I don't believe we are only competitive. And you only have to talk to evolutionary biologists who can talk to you at length about how profoundly innate our collaborative skills and talents are. But equally, I can go through all of the things I've just talked about and find different ways of achieving them. So for example, if I want to look at school systems, I can go to somewhere like Finland, which has one of the highest achieving school systems in the Western world, and discover what's happening there is all the tools required to get parents or kids to compete have been taken away. So the kids, most of the schools don't give grades. They give feedback, they don't give grades. They don't have standardized exams, so people can't compare their students. They don't do performance-related pay for their teachers. They don't do league tables of schools. So all of the mechanisms required for a good contest aren't there. Instead, they put as their benchmark of their education system was that at whatever speed, everybody had to get through it, that an education system was not deemed successful for the number of high flyers it produced, but for how effectively it got everyone through it. At the same time, I went to Singapore, because Singapore also apparently has one of the highest achieving educational systems in the world, and I was interested to know what was going on there, and that surprised me, because I talked to educationalists in the government and in schools who said, you know, we did have a fiercely competitive education system, and we think it got us to where we are today, but we know that if it doesn't change now, we're dead, because we have produced fantastic little machines who will give the right answer to anything they're asked and will do as they're told, but what they can't do yet is do creative problem solving and collaborative work. And if the new generation, the rising generations of students in Singapore can't do that, we will not progress. In companies, what I've seen is interesting. Microsoft, as in the time that I was writing the book, decided to throw out its forced ranking system at the same time as they appointed a new CEO. And the new CEO made it very clear that the future of the company lay in getting the parts of the company to interoperate. And he has made a practice every week of meeting the new hires because he feels that the existing workforce may be so ingrained with this competitive thinking that essentially it's the new generation, or as he calls it, the blood transfusion, that's going to bring the correct mindset into the company. And one of the things he's saying to all these new hires is, if you are ever told that you can't work with other people or there's nothing in it for you, you have to come and tell me. Because it's in that interoperation and in that collaboration that our future lies. I've also visited a lot of companies which have decided very specifically not not to grow, but that bigness in and of itself wasn't a measure of prosperity. 
So one of the companies that I studied was Arup, one of the world's most successful global structural engineering firms. And they have a set of values, and one of their values is reasonable prosperity, which is they want to grow, they want to grow slowly, they want to grow because that's how the people in the company grow, but only to the degree that they can do that securely in a way that doesn't put the business at risk. This is a 60-year-old business that has never had a single year of, la of losses, nor ever had to do layoffs. And when I asked them, what was it that made this business so successful? One of the things they said was really telling. They said, well, we're fantastically good at solving hard problems. And I said, well, of course you are. You're structural engineers. That's what you're here for. They said, no, 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 it's different. It's different. And they told me a great story. So Arup is famous for, for building the most difficult, challenging buildings on Earth. And one of the buildings they built was the um, Bird's Nest Stadium in Beijing for the Beijing Olympics. And another building that they built was the Equestrian Center for the Beijing Olympics. And the project lead on that building had a very unusual problem to solve, which was what was the volume of waste that they needed to build for? Bearing in mind they were going to have a couple thousand highly strung, high-bred, very expensive horses getting off long-haul flights, very jet-lagged and quite neurotic. What were they going to do? And as they explained it to me, they said, you know, you could spend months working the spreadsheet of this problem, making assumptions, talking to vets, making best guesses, and then pretty much praying you got it right, because getting it wrong was not going to be pretty. Instead, the project lead put out an email blast to everybody in the company saying, here's my problem, does anybody know anything about this? And in less than an hour, got an answer from a colleague in New York saying, I know how to do it, here's the formula, I built the jockey club in New York. That quality of collaboration didn't just solve the problem faster, it's one reason people hire this company. And in fact, when you start studying what are the characteristics of the most successful work teams in companies, one thing and one thing only jumps out, which is you can, you know, IQ doesn't make any difference, levels of, ex of experience doesn't make any difference, educational qualification doesn't make any difference. What makes the difference between being able to solve high order problems quickly and successfully is the helpfulness that exists between the members of the team. It's the collective intelligence that makes these groups outstanding. And to the degree that you encourage those people to compete with each other, of course, you effectively disable what could make them so spectacular. I also talked to lots of companies around the world that have made very specific decisions about where to base their companies, how to pay their people, and how to use their wealth. I even, which was a shock, to inv uh, interviewed a CEO who said, I measure my success by the number of jobs I create. Imagine that. Most CEOs go on television and brag about the number of jobs they've just destroyed. <laughs> but there are companies out there that see success as, as only measurable by the degree that it's shared by a large number. And perhaps I'll just finish with this one. One of the most interesting of these companies is an American company called Ocean Spray. And it's probably familiar to most of you because they make an awful lot of cranberry juice. <laughs> and it's a really interesting business because this is a business owned by 750 cranberry farmers. And the cranberry farmers hire the management, and the management hires the food scientists and the marketers and all of that sort of thing. And as you can imagine, this is a very complex, not Harvard Business School business model. 
But the ethos of the business is we are here to serve the farmers to get the highest value for their crop so that they can keep their farms generation after generation. And what the CEO Randy Papadella said to me was, we are so good internally at collaborating with the farmers and across disciplines that it's made us tremendously good at collaborating externally. So they collaborate with Nestle, one of their competitors, in purchasing plastic. They compete with Danone in transportation. He said, we're almost incapable of doing anything without collaborating because we're so good at it and it's so efficient for us. And that's how, out of this almost inedible, bitter little red fruit, they've built a $3 billion global business. What Papadella said was, we just take the attitude the way that we live and work. And what I've been so struck by since I wrote the book is looking at really successful businesses, <coughs> looking at really successful teams, and seeing how this quality of helpfulness and collaboration runs through them all. And I think it really challenges us to kick our addiction to competition and start rediscovering and honing the collaborative talents that we have. Thank you very much.